archive these and make them available after the fact. Um, so I'd like to welcome everybody to this Open Education Week installment of the Iowa OER webinar series. These are semi-regular information sessions and discussions for people who are working on various types of OER projects in Iowa and beyond. If you have topics of interest that you'd like to see covered in these webinars, you can always send us a message through the Iowa OER Google group. And I will post a link to that, um, that group as well as some other relevant links in the chat in just a few minutes. My name is Mariah Burnett, and I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of Iowa. And today I am joined by Marsha Kortz, who's the Instructor of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Iowa, as well as Shannon Brunner, who's the Instructional Designer and Instructor at, um, who is an Instructional Designer and, North, and Instructor at Northeast Iowa Community College. Uh, Marsha has been teaching uh, lecture and laboratory classes at the University of Iowa's Department of Microbiology and Immunology since 1997. She was an early adopter of computer-aided instruction in the biological sciences and is delighted that the ease of authoring and egalitarianism first promised during her earliest instructional project three decades ago is finally coming closer to reality through OER. She'll be discussing her experiences using OER in her undergraduate courses, general microbiology lecture and lab for the past 10 semesters. Specifically, she'll explore some advantages and disadvantages that she's found using the OpenStax microbiology textbook and the next generation version of that text entitled Microbiology Canadian Edition. And that text is by Winley, Wendy Keenly-Side. Shannon is a full-time instructional designer and adjunct faculty member for Northeast Iowa Community College. She has over a decade of experience in teaching, academic coaching, and accessibility support. Her goal is to design and facilitate courses that meet the unique strengths and needs of all types of learners while leveraging exciting and accessible technology. She holds master's degrees in professional writing and teaching from Chatham University and a BA in English from the University of Pittsburgh. Shannon will share how she utilizes the college success text from OpenStax in her college experience course. She'll also share from an instructional design standpoint, some insights on how OER can help faculty design and develop courses that meet quality standards with a university des universal design for learning framework. So for this session, I'd like to keep our microphones muted until the question and answer and discussion period. But if you have questions or comments in the meantime, just feel free to type them into the chat and we can bring them up when the time is right. Um, after the presentations that uh, Marsha and Shannon um, give, we will have plenty of time for discussion in Q&A. So um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Marsha. Okay, thank you, Micah. I'll go ahead and share my screen, see if I can get this to work today. All right, so if you're uh, looking at my PowerPoint here, so um, I know Mary has just introduced me, but just a little bit more about how my journey uh, academically and professionally has led me to a, be, becoming a proponent of OpenStax. So I thought uh, it would be relevant to discuss who I am, my journey to open educational resources. So I've been a full-time teacher in microbiology uh, since finishing my PhD in 1988. So even before I came to the University of Iowa, I'd been teaching for 10 years. Um, so I am old. Uh, the courses that I've taught range from lecture and lab classes um, that have been designed for a range of students, everything from undergrad non-science majors through to postgraduate students who are in medical and dental schools. So I've really worked with many thousands of different types of students over the decades. But my main audience over these years and the ones I'm really passionate about are undergraduates, um, mostly who are sophomores and juniors. And these are the folks who are taking their very first microbiology class. And they're very goal oriented. They're all or almost all of them are taking this microbiology class because it's on the road to apply to medical school or PA school or dental school or other highly competitive postgraduate healthcare careers. So this is, this is who I'm talking about. Um, hopefully 
my audience uh, will seem applicable to whatever's motivated you to tune in today, but I'm, I'm very much in context here that these are the people that I think about 24 seven, how do I suit their needs? Um, so um, in other words, these are really highly motivated folks and they really want that A grade and they will do anything. And basically if I told them to memorize the phone book, Back in the days when there were actual phone books that were thick and just had name, rows of names and phone numbers, uh, they would. They would memorize the phone book if it could give them an A. However, I don't really want them to do that, even though they're willing to. I don't want them to be able to recall picayune details ad infinitum. So I really have striven as we all do, those of us who care about teaching, we've all striving for understanding of difficult concepts, training students to apply the fundamental principles and then apply information and analyze uh, what they're learning. So of the many widely used microbiology textbooks that are out there today, I've never found any uh, that really support my priorities. Um, here, I just happen to have one, here would be one of these mega books, weighs about 15 pounds, thousands of pages of very tiny text. So these texts, I feel the fundamental principles of microbiology are beautifully and accurately portrayed, but the fundamental principles get lost uh, behind an encyclopedic presentation of all the caveats, the exceptions, the tangential information um, that these textbook authors feel they need to put in. And because they're packed chock-a-block full of details, they retail for about 100 to 120 to $200 um, for one of these books. And they're re -re released every two to three years. So you're constantly, my students would have to constantly be buying new editions. So, and then aside from the cost, there's this question that I most dread to hear from the students. What do we have to know from the textbook? Meaning, how do I get my A? Tell me which of these thousands of pages, which ones do I have to memorize? So, I've long had concerns about the encyclopedic nature and that it's just overwhelming for new students. And uh, a few semesters ago, a student uh, unsolicited, she was writing uh, comments to other students so that she was not writing for me, she was writing for others. And she summed it up her feelings about reading textbooks as, when I see long paragraphs written out about something I have no information on, I dread wanting to read it and sometimes simply don't and just skim over the information. So I think this is just really telling. This is, this is how an, a student talking with her peers expresses her feeling about reading information. So very humbling for those of us who, you know, we want you to love this stuff. So um, despite so I think I've, I hope I've summed up for you that I, I have misgivings about the cost of textbooks and about the effectiveness of textbooks. And I've had these concerns, you know, since 1988. Um, but I still know that the students need to hear about microbiology in another voice besides my own, no matter how brilliantly I might lecture, if at all, there, no matter how good my notes are uh, that I provide for them, no matter how great my PowerPoint slides, they've, they've got to hear somebody else talking about microbiology besides just me. And I know that. So uh, while searching for an inexpensive text uh, that appropriately emphasizes the basics of microbiology, about eight years ago, I discovered the OpenStax microbiology. And I can't remember, I've been trying to recall, how did I come across this the first time? And I, I really don't know. I, I had not met Mary Ray or, Mary Ray or anybody from her um, organization. Um, so I don't remember how I came across it, but I did. And if I go to, uh, so hopefully you can see, whoops, hopefully you can see this. So now I'm on a website. 
And um, Shannon might be showing the same uh, image, but this is this is the home page of the OpenStax text, so that you can see their their headline here: peer reviewed, openly licensed, a hundred percent free. Um, and so, if you've never seen this, obviously, uh, this is this is what they're going for. And I just wanted you to notice that up here in the upper right corner. Um, I, it recognizes who I am uh, at no cost. I was able to register uh, as, as, as a user of this system. Uh, and so I'm able to save information within this and pretty smart, it's remembering me here. Uh, but overall then we've got some business books, statistics. I think here's the book perhaps Shannon will be discussing. Um, history, humanities, K-12 stuff, math, calculus, algebra, stats, and then astronomy, physics, biology, and finally then we get to microbiology. So here then um, out, of, out of the uh, choices that are all available here, um, our books have been used in 38,000 classrooms, they say, saving students some billions of dollars since 2012. Okay, so um, that's OpenStax. And if I go now to the, the book that I really is the only one that I've ever dealt with, is the microbiology textbook. And you can still see it's still remembering me here and would remember all my highlighting and notes that I've made to myself. So here's the first thing you see in a nice little summary and uh, uh, contributing authors, okay? none, of, none of whom are by any means the most famous leading microbiologists out there, just hardworking um, instructors and passionate about this field. And then the get the book here, View online, download the app, download a PDF, order a print copy. Okay, so it's multiple options, but I've mostly just used the online version. And I hopefully you can see this pretty well, the table of contents. And this table of contents is basically the same as any of the first line uh, microbiology books here. Um, it, it all starts with, you know, who were the first people to see microbes and then how do you how do you use microscopes and and what is a cell and so it all goes this is a very specific progression that all basically all the textbooks use so very standard um and then i do like um the review questions here at the end that students can you know little self quizzing which very helpful obviously um so that's that's the book and um, I, I don't know that any of you out there who are listening are microbiologists, so I won't go too much into detail here, um, but other than to say that it's a good standard microbiology text. And let me just give one example here. A few minutes ago, I, I talked about the encyclopedic nature um, and that, uh, that it's just so encyclopedic. It gives every example, every instance these, these, you know, are our, our $200 texts. They, they're just overwhelming in the amount of detail they provide. So I've just picked out one example out of the book to kind of show you the contrast of what I'm talking about. So in the OpenStax text, uh, there's, uh, here is the section on fluorescence microscopy. Very, very important technique in microbiology today. Couldn't teach a class without talking about fluorescence microscopy and some of the things we learned from them. And there's some chemistry involved in it. Uh, but here it is, you know, what is it used? A couple bold face terms, a couple of pictures of what an, a microorganism looks like when it's viewed in fluorescence microscopy, kind of a cartoon diagram showing what's going on basically. And then if you can see down here, a nice little check your understanding have you, were you, did you stay awake uh, through these previous four paragraphs and diagrams, right? So very nice little, for the, the student who's really trying, um, this is just a great little summary question that they should be able to answer. All right, so that's one example of the depth, which I find entirely appropriate in the OpenStax book. And if I go back now to my PowerPoint, um, here is the same comparable information in this standard 
one of the better, I think, um, modern textbooks. And oh my gosh, okay, so here's here's the same amount of information that was just covered in four uh, four paragraphs and two pictures. All right, so here's oh more examples of how it can be used. Okay, chemical structures. Well, that's great if you've a student who's already had a biochem class, but not all students have. Uh, here's some examples, more examples of how it gets used. Here's a scientist using fluorescence microscopy for a specific technique. Oh, and then up here we go. Here's a concern with the use of the techniques. It's like, come on. These are a bunch of 20 year olds who've never heard of fluorescence microscopy before. How, how are they possibly going to absorb all that? And then it moves on to another scientist, which is lovely. It gives context. It shows that people have careers in science. It's lovely. But is it, is it really the right thing uh, for our students on their first trying to understand all this to be provided with so much detail um, to search through? So again, going back to my, my apocryphal student, when I see long paragraphs written out about something I have no information on, I dread wanting to read it and sometimes simply don't and just skim over the information. So, I, I hope that kind of illustrates with that example why I'm finding that the OpenStax text to be advantageous for my needs. Um, of course, it is free. Great. It's available at no cost in multiple formats, online, downloadable PDF. And the most recent version I downloaded was about 180 megabytes. So pretty fairly doable. You know, it's a few minutes to download, but totally doable or available as an app. Uh, or I think um, hard copies could be purchased for those students. And there are those students um, who really would like a hard, a hardcover book. As I've tried to illustrate there with my little example about fluorescence microscopy, presents the fundamental topics in a straightforward, no frills fashion. And it will include self-quizzing features for each chapter, uh, which I just think is really important for the self-motivated students. The questions range through the gamut, everything from simple vocabulary practice, very important, but kind of boring to do, uh, but there, those, are the, those questions are there, up to higher order application and critical thinking problems. And uh, the OpenStax case in microbiology, and I don't know how, how widespread it is if you get outside of microbiology, but there's numerous case studies, different infectious diseases and scenarios, and these are all easily adapted to my pedagogy. And regarding the dreaded question, but what do we have to know from the textbook? Now all my tests are open book. Um, everybody can afford the textbook. So it's an open book text uh, test. And I think that alleviates this concern of, yeah, but what did I really need to know, you know, paragraph 17 of, you know, of, of that one section. So uh, mostly advantages here, which I think are pretty good. The, the disadvantages that I've found is that, of course, not everybody still takes advantage of it. There's, for whatever reason, a free text still isn't, you know, you got to be an organized student to get to it. So, um, and I do have to point out that in my experience, the site has occasionally crashed or it's become unavailable with no notice. And you know that's not particularly a, a big deal, except one time it was during an open book test. So that was that was a bit, or it was just right in advance of the test, I guess. So the students were were panicking, uh, although the site did I think become available right at the last minute before the test started. So so that an infrequent problem, but I thought I'd point it out. And I have found mistakes in the text and the labeling of some diagrams, uh, but all the open stacks do have a mechanism to report this. So if I go back uh, to here, so if we go back to the main homepage here, you can see that right here on the front page of the book, right down here is errata. So all textbooks undergo rigorous review processes. And I have suggested numerous corrections and about a month or two later, I see that they do tend to get implemented and with a nice little thank you kind of acknowledgement. Um, so I'm, it's, it's, it's perfect. I mean, I've, I've been very happy with it. Um, so, 
So I did think I, I would share with you a few comments that I've received over the years. So this is very anecdotal. Um, these are just unsolicited comments that I have received um, regarding the book. So there was one student, again, unsolicited, just gratefully expressed appreciation that I had chosen a free, free, a free book and that um, was really grateful that I seemed to understand some student financial stresses. Okay, but another unsolicited comment, student told me they would have preferred to buy a traditional book. Uh, the student felt that a costlier text would have been better uh, for whatever their needs. Um, and another individual, I, I thought this was kind of interesting, was contact me. They were trying to decide whether or not to sign up for the class and being able to preview the text at no cost during pre-registration period, um, that was really help them inform their decision. So I thought that was kind of a neat thing to point out. And then I also participate in a listserv that's composed of microbiology instructors from around the world. We talk about our woes. Um, and the topic of the OpenStax microbiology did come up. And again, this is anecdotal, informal, not <laughs> just a, an internet task. You know, general survey, but about half of those participating really liked using the microbiology OpenStax in their courses, and they were had received overall positive feedback from their students. So I'd say that was roughly half of my informal survey here. But there were also in, instructors in the group who said, no, we, we used it, we didn't like it, we've moved on to other books. And I thought this was interesting that one student instructor specifically had abandoned the book because it was written at too high a level for her students. And boy, I, I don't know what text she turned to because I think one of the strengths of this is, is that it is at a good level. Um, but it was during this discussion among microbiology instructors a few semesters ago that I learned about another version of OpenStax microbiology. And it had added on a few chapters to enhance the coverage of environmental microbiology. And so uh, that's, Mara mentioned it in our, um, in my introduction here, but if I go back here to the internet, and here now is this version that's come out. Um, again, you can download it, about 180 meg, um, or just use it online. And if I go to the book itself, uh, click on the contents window up here. Now you see I'm no longer remembered. They don't know who I am. I suppose I could register. I just have never bothered to. Uh, but if we go back to um, the table of contents, it's basically the same until we get down here to chapter 10, a completely new and wonderful chapter that Winley Keeley side has added in, which really augmented some of the material I really needed. Uh, so great new chapter. Um, adding on to what had been already a book that pretty well met my needs. But just to show you, um, in case you're wondering, if we go back to uh, what we had, the section I showed you about 10 minutes ago, we can go back to that. And the text, let's see if I get to it here. So here we get the text is identical here, the same four paragraphs. Uh, but this version has switched in a few different images instead. Uh, but then we get to the same nice summary question. Hey, kid, student, don't keep reading unless, you know, if you're, are you still awake? Can you answer this question about the material you've just read? Uh, so I just really, I really think um, it's great. Um, so my summary. So my summary points then, um, this book that I just showed you, um, it suits my pedagogical goals better than any other microbiology text on the market. Uh, one disadvantage uh, that I forgot to mention is that the, the uh, this version was downloaded by Dr. Keeley side and she started making adaptations in it before some of the changes that I suggested in the original book had been implemented. 
So um, I, some of those bad, <laughs> some of those bad errors have cropped up again. So that is one kind of confusing issue, but at least I know about them and can alert my students to be aware of them. Uh, but still, even with those few errors that are a holdover from the earlier version, it still suits my pedagogical goals better than anything else on the market. And so what's been left out, it's abbreviated. Yes, it gives chunks of information that I think a beginning student can actually grasp and focus on without getting lost in the milieu. Um, and there's just so many great YouTubes and internet resources out there that anytime I do find that the, the OpenStax text is a little deficient in this, I can just supplement any specific content deficiencies that may exist in the book. Just There's just so much out there. My students don't have to be paying for it. And I just am keenly aware that post COVID, so many of our students are feeling serious emotional and financial difficulties. And then I really feel that a free textbook is making a small start uh, towards addressing some of the stress that I see in uh, my students today. So that's my little spiel. Um, if there's anything I could add or um, clarify, just please, um, I think you have my contact information, but please feel free to contact me. Great. Thank you so much um, for, for such an informative presentation about yeah, you bet. experiences. We have a few questions in the chat. Um, let me see. Let me pull it up here. Um, so uh, Jody asks, Dr. Quartz, is there a lab component to your class? Uh, does OpenStax have a lab manual? Is it built into the text or do you use something else? Uh, I do have teach a lab class. Uh, I but I have developed over the years my own lab manual and that's so there are separate courses I just use the OpenStax as you know kind of background reading for certain lab exercises. Yeah, you you couldn't you couldn't make a, a lab course out of OpenStax as as it is as it exists. And then the next question, sorry, my computer just decided to turn on its very loud fans. So oh. <laughs> apologize if it's uh, too loud, but um, Anne Marie asks, have you connected the questions to the course management system so they can be graded? And is that possible? Uh, I don't know if it's possible. Um, I have no interest in making these questions self gradable. Um, uh, I have I have other questions that um, I'm I'm interested in asking. The the, the ones that are built into OpenStax um, are just what I use. Shannon might have some, some more insight than I do actually in terms of trying to integrate into courses, uh, the course information software. It's just nothing I've ever been interested in doing. Yeah, I can tell you that um, you can't integrate the questions that are in the text itself, but because it's open source material, you can reuse it freely. So you could copy and paste those questions into a discussion post or an activity in your LMS and use it that way. And then also OpenStax provides quiz banks and things like that. So some of those questions may show up in a question bank, which I'll share a little bit in my presentation. Great. And then one follow up from Jody: Are you interest or are you inspired to openly publish your lab manual or to edit the existing OpenStax text so that it is perfect for you? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> I'm retiring in about. 64 more days. <laughs> so I'm kind of focused on that. Um, if I were young um, and enthusiastic um, still, I'm, I would certainly hope I would be thinking about that. Um, Myra's office is so, got so many resources, she could help me, I think, but <laughs> no, <laughs> for me personally, no. This is my swan song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do have, um, I know of, um, a chemistry professor at University of Iowa who has done an um, OER lab manual for chemistry. And she doesn't teach it alongside OpenStax, but I think she might consider doing so in the future. Anybody else have any questions at this point? Okay, I'll turn it over to Shannon. Yeah, let me go ahead and share my screen. Everybody see my presentation? Yes. Sometimes I show the wrong screen. <laughs> okay. 
So I'm going to talk um, similarly to Marsha. I'm going to start a little bit with my kind of journey to OER, um, and then I have a little bit of information I want to share about some of the instructor resources, and I'm going to share a little bit of survey data from an OER survey that was done at our school um, in 21, AY 21 to 22. So to start out, um, before I came, so I came to NICC in April of 21. Before that, I had spent about six years working at a small private university in here. I live in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And I was working in academic support and disability services. So the office I worked for did both, provided both uh, services to the whole campus. So I worked mostly in academic coaching, um, both with students with and without disabilities, but almost entirely students who had some kind of barriers or extra challenges to success. And then I also taught a study skills course, which is similar to the college experience class that I teach now. Uh, at that school, that course was required for students who were conditionally admitted. And so they were already sort of, um, they were already kind of behind when they started out at the school. They were not very happy about having to take this extra course. And the textbook that I was given when I started, I started teaching the first day of the fall term. And so I got the instructor manual, you know, a week or two before I came on board through a PDF. And that was that, and that textbook was 60 or $70. And so many of those students were already struggling financially. They already had all these extra barriers. And now we were making them pay 60 bucks for a textbook for a class that they resented having to take. So I, it was something that I noticed that was a problem right away. Uh, and, and aside from that course, many of the students that I worked with never bought their books for their classes. Sometimes that was financial for financial reasons. Sometimes they were students with disabilities. And even though we would get accessible versions of their textbooks for them, they still really weren't accessible in the way that they need them to be. And so they just didn't bother. They didn't even bother opening them. Um, some of the screen reader software that we used was clunky or that they were using just it just didn't work for what they needed and so they just didn't bother they just skipped it and hoped for the best so that was kind of my experience um, so a couple of years into working there I started looking at alternative options for that study skills course and I didn't know what OER was at the time but I had been using resources from a guy called Thomas Frank, who um, runs a website called College Info Geek that has a lot of great resources for college success, and realized that he had a book that was $10, or if you signed up for his newsletter, you could get a free PDF version. And so I switched to that and immediately saw a difference in the students on day one, because they didn't come in with that textbook, you know, either having had just paid that or having the problem where they couldn't pay for that. So switched to that book and saw some great results. And then towards the end of my time there, I, I don't remember how I heard the term OER, but I heard it towards the end of my time and thought, this is, this is exactly what we need. Um, I don't think anybody at the university I was working for had any, was using OER at all. And I don't know if they are now, um, but it was something that was definitely on the forefront of my mind. And so when I came to NICC and OER was already a push at the school, they had developed a Z degree, zero cost uh, degree in 2018. And so uh, that degree is entirely OER courses. And some of those faculty then started using those OERs in other sections that weren't Z degree related. And so I just saw, I saw it snowballing in a really good way. So I was really excited when I came to NICC and saw the uh, potential there with OER. As an adjunct, I teach college experience and English comp for NICC. And so when I first got college experience, there were some faculty, and there still are, who are using a traditional textbook that costs about $70, um, I think, for the ebook and maybe 100 for the print book. And then the Z degree faculty were teaching it with the OER. So I immediately started using the OER that they were using, which was not OpenStax. And then after the first semester or two, I found the OpenStax version, which I liked better. And so I switched to it. And I'll talk a little bit about why I specifically like OpenStax as we go on here. So a little bit of data for you. So far in the semesters that I've been teaching college experience, um, I figured out that I've had 85 students. The ebook is around $52. Uh, and so, and I think, I don't remember if that's renting or buying, but <clears throat> that was the lowest cost I could find for the traditional ebook. So I figure I've saved my students nearly $4,500 just in three or four semesters. These are some quick numbers for you from an OER survey, not this wasn't specifically OpenStax, but OER in general that we did 
with students in online courses that were using OER uh, back in 21, 22. And so I just wanted to show you because we wanted some information about, in addition to the cost savings, whether we wanted to know whether students liked their OER as much as their textbooks or more. So we asked them a few questions kind of about engaging with their OER. This one was, how easy was it for them to access and read their texts? And you can see here that it, you know, the large majority, vast majority of them found them easy to, to use. Here we have, I think about 75% of them said it was either the same or easier to engage with their OER than their traditional textbooks. Um, I think more than 75% said they were at least as likely to complete their reading assignments when using OER. And the vast majority of them would prefer to, would choose an OER in the future if they were given the choice. We asked some open-ended comments about what they like about OER, and these were the most uh, popular answers. Obviously, they're free and easy to access. Students like that they can get them anywhere and that they don't have to lug heavy books around. They're easier to navigate. Um, from an accessibility standpoint, and I will, I think I have more information on that in a few slides. Um, you, I think you had probably saw Marsha at one point enlarge her screen really quickly to show you something. Students who are looking at, a, on, at an OpenStax book or any book on a website can enlarge their screen if they need to see something bigger at any time. When you look at that print textbook with the tiny text and there's so much text on a page, you can't do that. So that's just one really small, easy example of how much more accessible online texts can be. Even if you've never had a student or you don't know of any students in your class with a specific vision impairment, I'm sure we've all had students in class whose glasses were broken or they just hadn't updated their prescriptions in a while, you know? So vision impairments are not necessarily blindness, but they're all kinds of everyday issues that lots of people experience. And so that's just one small example of a universal design um, tip that helps make OER a really good choice. So I did ask a couple of, we did also ask them what they didn't like about OER. And there were a few responses here, mainly, some of them prefer print text. And the nice thing about OpenStax is that it is easy for them to purchase a low cost print version. Uh, and also through our school, if faculty are using different OER or they might be combining multiple OER for their course, they can order what's called a course pack through our bookstore. And so students can purchase a low cost um, printed copy of all of the OER materials being used. And some of them did mention that they didn't like the fact that they had to be connected to the internet in order to read their book. So, and that depends on how the materials provided to students. If they're given a PDF, they could potentially download that onto a computer and then read it offline. Uh, but if they are just given digital links, then that could be potentially an issue. I wanted to just really briefly talk a little bit about universal design. You've probably heard of this before, UDL or universal design for learning. is essentially a framework that um, encourages you to develop courses that will meet the needs of all of your learners. So basically, if you just assume that there's somebody in your classroom with a vision impairment, someone with a hearing impairment, someone with ADHD, maybe someone on the autism spectrum, just kind of assume those people are in your classroom at any given time and you design your course so that it works for all of them, then you've got a universally designed course. Um, these sort of accommodations or features work for people with disabilities, but they also just make life easier for people in general. A really simple example of a UDL design is the curb cutout in front of a you know grocery store that's maybe for shopping carts or wheelchairs, but is also useful for people with strollers or um, an automatic door, which is maybe meant for people who need need uh, disability support, but is also good if you're carrying a, a big box. You know the, these kinds of things that benefit everybody, not just those with disabilities. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm a big advocate for OERs because it really does uh, follow the UDL framework. So I think Marcia covered some of these, but I will mention uh, one of the things I like, some of the things I like specifically about OpenStax, obviously they're free and they've got that low cost print option and they can be read online. There are the multiple format options. I will say that I, aside from the uh, PDF being accessible offline, I always use the digital link directly to the readings and I encourage other faculty that I work with to do that too for a couple of reasons. 
One is that when the book gets updated, if you've got a digital link to the reading, then you're you're already you're always going to be up to date. Whereas if you have a PDF in your course, then you're going to need to re-upload that PDF every semester or check for updates. And the other is uh, PDF documents are not always as accessible. There, there usually are accessibility issues with PDF documents. And so linking out to a digital, uh, a digital link is going to be typically better for accessibility. Another thing I really like about OpenStax are the annotation tools that are provided for students. And I can show you what that looks like. Uh, when I'm done here, but there is a little screenshot here to show you some students. You see where it says highlights over on the left side of the screen. They can click on that. They can highlight text at any time and it will pop up a little window where they can add a note and color code their notes and then they can go back and view those notes anytime. And then also the mobile app. OpenStax has a really nice mobile app. You get a couple screenshots here. This is what it looks like when you're in a text. You first click into a text on the mobile app. And then you've got the table of contents for a chapter. And when you click into that, you can scroll th right through the chapter right here. I wanted to mention that because I've had a lot of students over the years who I find out are completing entire courses th through their phones because their computer's broken or they're sharing it with someone else or for whatever reason. And so I think it's really, really important to double check that uh, the materials that we use work for mobile devices. From the instructor side, OpenStax has a lot of really great resources uh, that are available, I think, for most, if not all of the books that they provide. There are LMS pack packages, and so the, for the main LMS, I know they have Blackboard, uh, D12 Brightspace, and Canvas, I think maybe those three, but you can import packages that will include all kinds of materials for instructors. You can see on this screenshot, there's an instructor guide, there's an accessibility guide, uh, some general resources for the text and an entire instruct, instructor, instructor manual here. They also have PowerPoint slides for each chapter, quiz question banks, uh, and then modules. Check out on the next page. When I imported this into my LMS, it gave me a module for each chapter. And then inside each chapter, there's a link to each section that goes directly to the digital reading. So if you wanted your students to read every single link, you could leave these like this, or you could delete the ones that you're not using. But it just gives you the nice, the entire package right here to use. So I, I really like that. Quiz question banks are nice. There are uh, um, multiple question types in here, true, false, multiple choice, written response. So you get a nice um, variety to pick from. And there were plenty of questions. I want to say 30 plus questions probably for each chapter in the book that I use, the College Success book. So that's my presentation. Um, if you have uh, any questions, let me know. You can always, I have my email here if you would like to reach out about anything. But in general, I find OpenStax to be um, my go-to for OER. It's the first place I look if I am looking for myself or working with a faculty member to see if there's a book available because it is packaged so well and it does provide the tools that learners can use to interact with it. I will share briefly what it looks like. Uh, I think this, the student tools are another reason to provide digital links directly. So this just shows you what it looks like if you want to see all of the notes or things that you've highlighted in a text all on one page. And then as students are reading, you can highlight, color code, and add a note. I also like the keyword search. I do uh, open book, open note quizzes that are really just designed to help encourage students to actually interact with the text more than anything. And so I tell them to come in here and use the keyword search to find the answers for the quiz, because I just, I know it's at least one time that they're actually definitely going to interact with the text. And so I really like the keyword search. I think it, uh, it helps get students to the information specifically that they need, because I don't use everything from the book. Well, 
thank you so much, Shannon, for this presentation. Um, I taught College Success too at one point in time several years ago, and I wish this uh, book would have been available then. We also had like a $60, $70 book that students absolutely hated, and it was so out of date. I remember the library resources that they were touting were things that, you know, I had never even encountered yet in my career. <laughs> so yeah. it was terrible. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, we had a couple questions. Um, I gave some erroneous information in the chat. Um, yeah, the personal copies, um, they depend on, on how long the book is. Um, some of them are around 15, anywhere from 15 to 50. Um, and then Nancy had asked, given that you teach study skills, do you spend time on how to actually do the annotations, highlighting, et cetera? That's a good question. Um, I, I do have a section in the course that talks about note-taking skills and active reading skills. Um, we, don't, we don't use the book specifically to do that. I focus more on lecture videos and other materials than I do on ICE. Kind of the book is kind of a supplement for the course for me. Um, but I do include in my course, which in the beginning of my course, I have Well, maybe it's in the second module. I have uh, a link. OpenStax actually has some information for students on how to use the annotation tools and some note taking tips. And so I provide a link to that at the beginning of the here, the student guide from OpenStax, a link to that so that they can get some help using the tools and some tips at the beginning. Great. I have kind of a nitty gritty question for you, Shannon. So your survey that you sent to students, did you develop that instrument yourself or was that, um, did, you, did you get those questions from some other organization or instrument? That was a survey developed by my department. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we we were kind of, we wanted to gather some OER information to help push it to other faculty who are outside of the Z degree. And mm -hmm. so we developed the questions and put it into online courses that we're using, the Z degree, Z degree courses and other online courses that we're using OER. Great. We're kind of in the process of developing um, sort of an end of course survey for students and instructors right now. And we're we're trying to kind of borrow from the existing surveys so that <laughs> they're at least kind of partially validated. Yeah. So, let's see, does anybody have any other questions, anything, any comments, anything that they'd like to bring up for discussion? You can feel free to unmute your mics at this point. One thing I'd like to ask, um, both of our presenters, have either of you ever considered, um, you know, editing the books yourself or like kind of cloning the content or um, sort of developing your own version of the books? Or are they kind of good enough as is? Um, I will say the one thing I do with them is turn the content into interactive lessons. We, we have a license for H5P, which some of you may have heard of, which lets you build interactive crossword puzzles and um, drag and drop activities and things like that. And I like to copy parts of the text and put it into those interactive lessons. So it'll be, it'll have the students read something, maybe watch a, a video that goes along with it and then answer a few questions or do a little activity to check their knowledge. So I like to pull the, I like to pull from OER and build lessons that way. Yeah, that's a, that's a good strategy. And Marie says a barrier for many faculty is the time required to redesign a course around a new book. Very true. Any suggestions for overcoming that barrier? If you have instructional designers, use them because <laughs> they will they will absolutely help with that process. Absolutely. Mosi asks, our college is offering mini grants, but there are probably outside grant opportunities for that time. Absolutely. That's one of our grant categories for our mini grants as well as course redesign. And we really encourage anyone applying for that grant to work with our instructional designers to help with that because it is an onerous process. Even if you're adopting a totally pre-existing book that you're not even going to edit at all, you will have to sort of adjust your course. So it is good to build that into your planning. I, I had, I, oh, sorry. I had explored an answer to the question a couple of minutes, minutes ago. I had explored trying to integrate more into uh, the course software. Um, and Shannon just mentioned H5P, which 
is has a ton of potentials, as she says, for writing really creative um, quiz questions. But at the University of Iowa, it, that is not currently available through our course software. And so it would have had to be a separate package, kind of a standalone, and I, I wasn't ready to get into that. Anne-Marie says, do you ever present at disciplinary conferences about your open book use? That strikes me as one way to help others think about free options. Mm. I'm not, but that's a great idea. That is a good idea. Yeah, it is. Well, um, any other questions or anything? I would say, you know, just in, in summary, OpenStax is really, I mean, for those of you who may be interested in OER, but don't really have a ton of extra time to develop resources, OE, um, OpenStax is a really great starting jumping off point, especially if you teach sort of like an intro level course or a survey course, um, you know, those, those textbooks are really developed for those kind of um, classes. So, you know, it's it's a good place to, to start and get your feet wet with OER. So, um, Thanks today to our speakers um, and thanks to everybody who made the time to attend today. Um, yeah, these webinars, again, kind of happen <laughs> somewhat regularly um, once or twice a semester. So um, feel free to send us um, any ideas that you have for other, other um, sessions. Enjoy the rest of your day and happy Open Education Week. See you all later. Thank you.